morning. Grab your Bibles with me if you would and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to finish up um, <clears throat> what we <clears throat> began last week, which was looking at uh, this text and this charge by the Apostle Paul to Timothy to preach the word. And um, we are going to use this text to <clears throat> inform us of what good preaching is. And I told you that we're going to do that for two reasons. First, because I want you to measure uh, the preaching that happens here, uh, not by subjective measures of how you feel about it or anything else, but, but by um, the Word of God. And I want you to hold me specifically accountable to preaching that accords with the Scriptures. But there was a second reason, and the second reason is, is that, um, and we do thank God for the fact that there is <clears throat> a lot of teaching and preaching available to us today on television or on YouTube. And <clears throat> We want to make sure that as we listen to other people preach, that that preaching also accords with what the Bible says good preaching is. And so last week, um, we looked at what uh, this charge to Timothy was to preach the word, and we saw that that charge uh, actually flowed out of um, the previous text of, of three, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that... <clears throat> That the nature of what the word is naturally brings about the need to preach it. Because of what the word is, it must be preached. But, uh, so we saw that, and then so there was the nature of the word that necessitates preaching, but then there's a, another reason on the other side of the charge, and that is um, not the nature of the word, but really uh, the nature of the world and what it is that we humans uh, are after. And so um, I'm going to pray for our time together, and then we're going to read this text, and then we're going to get to work. So Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that we have the privilege to to read it and to sing it, and God, to have it proclaimed to us. And Father, we ask that as your word is preached this morning, that your spirit would move among us and change us and shape us for your glory. Do that. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. This is the Apostle Paul in prison writing to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching for or because the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already, now this is Paul talking, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, to, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So the Apostle Paul takes time to explain to us what the Scriptures are. And the Scriptures are God-breathed, and they are profitable, and they are sufficient, and they are Christ-centered. And because of that, um, from chapter 3, he rolls into this, really, this final charge to Timothy. And the final charge to Timothy is, is take that sufficient, Christ-centered, profitable Word and 
preach it. And do it in a, um, with readiness. Ready in season and out of season. And do it to reprove and rebuke and exhort. And do it with complete patience and teaching. So we covered that last week. It's the nature of the Word that necessitates this preaching. And then this morning, we'll spend all of our time looking at the fact that not only does the nature of the Word necessitate preaching, but the nature of the world. And so look at this, verse 3. For the time, now that word time directly links back up to the season. Remember? Because there's a season in which preaching is in and there is a season in which preaching is out. And sometimes the young preacher must know that there are seasons when, when the Word is proclaimed and it is received well, but there are seasons where it is not. And so Paul links up that word time to this out of season idea and this is what he says. For the time is coming... When people will not endure sound or healthy teaching. Do you, do you see though, and it's, it's interesting, I need to point this out. There is a certain endurance that is required on behalf of the hearers of God's word to, to hear it. That there's a certain level of endurance that's required. Sometimes you, the word is opened and you sit through um, good preaching and there's a level of endurance required because the word wielded by the spirit coming out of the mouth of a preacher is, is coming at you a bit. Um, and you say to yourself, this is going to be a long one this morning because we're not even hardly getting going yet and God is after me. And so there's a level of endurance as you're reproved and rebuked and exhorted and corrected and encouraged. And Paul says there will be some who will not endure sound teaching or healthy teaching. And they will have itching ears and will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Notice that these hearers of the word, it is the nature of the human soul, is it not to want to find uh, someone who will just say something that will agree with what you're doing? That, that's human nature. That's why we talk to ourselves so much, because we tend to agree with ourselves quite often. And so, so as we talk to ourselves and, and tell ourselves things, Paul says the time is coming when, when people will have itching ears and they're going to want someone to scratch those ears for them, surface level. And so what they're going to do is they're going to set out to accumulate for themselves teachers that will just go along with them. It is a man-centeredness that brings about this sort of longing. It is, this is what I think, what I feel, what I believe. Now let me go find someone that will preach that. And it would be wonderful, would it not, if every time we strayed from the Scriptures, strayed off into unhealthy teaching, found ourselves with itching ears, it would be awesome, would it not, if, if in order to find someone to go along with us, we had to look really, really hard? That'd be great. It's just not the case. The case is, is if you want someone to preach what you believe without ever challenging it or questioning it, there are many. And it is unfortunate that this is the case. But we need to think about the fact that, that Paul is telling Timothy, this is what's going to happen. Timothy, you're going to preach. People aren't going to like it. They won't be able to endure that teaching. They're going to have their own passions and their own beliefs. Those passions and beliefs will not accord with the Scriptures. So, in wanting someone to preach to them and affirm them, they're going to go out looking for these teachers. And are they going to find them? The answer to that is, yes, they will. Now, by way of word of warning to you, that means that by, by definition, that not everybody that's preaching is preaching healthy. There are many 
preachers that are preaching unhealthy things. In fact, I would say more often than not, I, I, you can't quantify this, but if you took all the preachers uh, in, the, in the world today, I, I don't know what percentage of them are preaching healthy versus unhealthy doctrine, but, but my suspicion would be that there are less preaching the actual word, the sufficient Christ-centered word, than there are um, preaching uh, th- this other foolishness. And so you need to be careful, church, because we can get very, very enamored by people who have a Bible open in front of them and by people who have a big church, quote unquote, can gather a crowd. And you can just begin assuming, well, he must be legit. And and in fact, Paul says there's going to be a bunch of them that are not. And so we must be careful. Now, Paul continues on the thought, yeah, they're going to have itching ears and they're going to go find false teachers that's going to suit their own passions. And there's a bunch of them, but here's the outcome of that. Verse 4, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And you notice here that truth, which is what Paul believes He's writing, which is what he's calling Timothy to preach. These truths do not mingle with myths. The truth is is mutually exclusive. It's heading in one direction, and these myths are heading in another one. You you can't, in Paul's mind anyway, you cannot take the, the truth of God's word and mingle it with something else and still have truth. It's either the word or it's a foolish, silly myth. And so Paul says, this truth won't mingle. They are going to leave the truth. They're going to wander off into myths. And this is what they're going to do. Now, I would have to imagine that as Timothy is reading this letter, he's pastoring a church in Ephesus, and I would think that Timothy, as he's receiving this word from Paul, is thinking to himself, what are the, the, the myths, what are the wanderings, what are the foolish things? Things that people are running after in my church. I mean, he's got to be thinking that. Like, like uh, you know, people are going to have itching ears and go find false teachers. He's like, yeah, so-and-so had itching ears. They told me that they didn't want me to teach the scriptures anymore. And so um, they went off and headed someplace. I mean, he's got to have people like this in his mind. And he's got to know of false teachers in Ephesus that are preaching foolish myths and and lies and unhealthy doctrine. He's got to know who they are. And I know who they are here. And you know that I have (laughs) dropped some names before of false teachers. Um, But the trouble with me dropping their names is, is that then you get very offended, I've noticed. And and then what happens is, is that um, I can no longer make the point I'm trying to make because Joel Osteen's your guy and I just said he's a false teacher and now I've lost you. And so rather than critiquing specific false teachers, which I have done and which the scriptures give you the permission to do and which, which Paul is not afraid to do, name names, I, th- I think it's it's wise for us to divorce the name and, and instead leave, leave the name out of it and just look at these, these man-made myths, these man-centered myths that have been perpetuated in our day. And I'm not going to do this very long, but we're going to look at a few of them because they are prevalent. And, and unfor- here's the other thing. Um, in trying to drop names, uh, there's a, I mean, the list is so long, uh, you can't even hardly sum them all up anymore. That's one of the problems with YouTube is, is now everybody's got a church and everybody wants to be the next T.D. Jakes and it's, it's, it's problematic. And so what I want to do is, is, is I want to just point out the fact that there are uh, two Gospels th- th- that you can hear. 
The first is a God-centered, Christ-exalting, God-glorifying, repentance is necessary for faith um, gospel that has been handed down to us through the Scriptures and, and, and that Paul is handing down to Timothy. That gospel is going to find itself in the Scriptures. Those Scriptures are sufficient. They're going to call us to... to um, to forsake uh, all things and, and follow after Christ. That's a man, or th- that is a Christ exalting, God centered gospel. That, that's what the word is. But there, are, there is also a, a man centered gospel. And a man centered gospel is going to use a lot of the language of a God centered gospel. It's just that the ultimate aim of a man centered gospel is you, not God. And that's what makes it a bit tricky. Because most of the guys preaching a man-centered gospel are preaching it with an open Bible to a church. A man-centered gospel, and I'm using that language intentionally, gospel by definition means good news. A God-centered gospel is really good news because a God-centered gospel is going to continue to confront you with the good news of what God has done through Christ for you. But a man-centered gospel is not good news because a man-centered gospel is, is, is always going to point back to you. You are its origin and you are its end. And there's a lot of man-centered gospels out there. Probably three of the most popular are this. First, you have the self-help gospel. And this... And the self-help gospel is essentially, and by the way, I didn't Google these. I mean, I'm kind of making these words up. But as I listen to people preach who are bad, I put them into categories. Self-help gospel, I don't know if that's a thing, but it certainly appears to be when you listen to certain people teach. And the self-help gospel is basically this, that you need to essentially look inside of yourself to fix what's gone wrong. You need to look, look inside, you are awesome. And since you're so awesome, the, the solutions to your problems are, are, are inside of you. Now, so look in there. Find them in your pool of awesomeness and then just work it out. Now, that's actually really bad news. Do you know why? Because you're actually not that awesome. In fact, the Bible goes to great lengths. This is why some of us can't endure the the teaching like this. The Bible goes to great lengths to say quite the opposite. You're not very awesome at all. And so the problem here, and look, I mean, the, the, okay, so the problem here, we're just going to do this. The, the problem here ends up working out like this. Not only are you not awesome, so you're already believing a lie about yourself, but, but here's, here's where the, that news actually becomes crushing if you'll think about it. Not only are you not awesome, so you're already believing a lie, but... If it is up to you to look inside of you to fix you, then, then, then you are putting a burden on yourself that will actually crush you. The reason we love the God-centered gospel is because the God-centered gospel shows us that God is awesome and we're actually not. And that's actually some of the most freeing news you'll ever come across. Because if God's awesome and I'm not, then I'm free to stop trying to look inside of me to fix me and instead just look to Him. And and what ends up happening there is is that rather than being crushed under the weight of, of the responsibility that I supposedly have to look in me to fix me, instead I look to Him. And what I see there is someone who is able to deal with me. And that it becomes so much less about positive thinking or whatever else and so much more about just the truth of who God is over and against the truth of who I am. And when I let the truth of who He is roll up into the truth of who I am, here's what it is. He's awesome, I'm not. But He is so awesome that He can do something about the fact that I'm not. And that's what the cross of Jesus Christ is all about. And so we don't look inside of us. But where there is value in looking inside of you is here. When you do look inside of you, this is what you're going to find. If you'll be honest with yourself. 
you will find that you are utterly unable. You you fall so far short of the task of fixing yourself. This is what happened at the point of your salvation, whether you are aware of it or not. You realize that you were unable to save yourself and that God has put forth a sufficient Savior who is able to save you. And so you turned away from trusting and trying to fix you. You turned away from trusting in you, and you turned to Christ. And in that moment, you became one of His. And I would argue with you, and we could do this, that it was actually in seeing your deficiencies that brought you to the point of that salvation. Which is why I will name names, and which is why we will point this out, because because a self-help gospel is no gospel at all. And it will damn you to hell if you think that you can fix you. That's why these things matter. So the self-help gospel is no gospel at all. This one actually uh, was pointed out to me last week. I, we'll call this one the practical gospel. And this one's interesting because I had somebody come down front and just make a great observation. He said, man, Alex, I... I've been noticing how many preachers and how many sermons are these really super practical ones like five steps to a better marriage or seven steps to being a better parent or four steps to being a better financial guy or 15 steps to being a better leader or 34 steps to lowering your handicap or or whatever, right? And so there's there's all of these, and and, and here's the problem with those, Be, be careful, be careful if it, you aren't getting that from me, by the way. I'm not smart enough to think of all of those. But be careful if your steady diet of YouTube preachers is always seven steps to being a better husband. Be, because there's nothing wrong with being practical, and we ought to be practical, and the Bible's very practical. But as I've listened to a lot of those kind of sermons, here's what you find it, it's, it's, it's just another man centered gospel. As if somehow all God cared about was you doing these seven steps, most of which oftentimes are are not linked to the gospel at all. And doing these seven steps help you just have a better life. And that's basically what it is, is it's just, you want a better life? You want more money? Listen to this sermon. You want better sex? Listen to this sermon. You want to stop trying to, you know, choke your husband? Listen to this sermon. You want to put the zip ties away with your kids? Listen to this sermon. And, and all of those things are, are good. Marriage matters, and you know that, and financial stewardship matters. But if those things are not informed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you could just preach that sermon in a mosque, and you and, and you'd get some amens, then we're not preaching Christian sermons at that point. And a lot of those sermons are practical, but they aren't Christ-centered. Be careful with that. Be careful with that. I might say one more thing about that. I have no problem, by the way, titling a sermon, Seven Steps to Being a Better Husband. I don't think that makes you a heretic. But but if you're going to do those seven steps, they'd all better point to Jesus Christ. Because if they don't, then here's what you've just done. You've basically gone to point number one, which is the self-help gospel. You're putting the burden on you. Now, if you'll... We're going to do this too, because I think this is really important. If, If you will actually go read what the Bible actually tells a husband to do, you know what you're going to conclude? This is impossible. This is impossible. I can't do this. Now, here's what you can do. I can't do this. Well, wait a second, Alex. Think more positively about yourself. Look deep inside of you and conclude that you actually can do this. But here's the thing. If you're going to conclude that you actually can do this, then here's what you've just done. You're no longer interacting with the actual text of Scripture. Because to love your wife as Christ loved his church is an impossible task. And it is actually directly within the, 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 the reality of that impossibility that then you realize, oh, so maybe looking inside of me to be this better husband is not the answer. Maybe the way that Christ has loved me on the cross ought to inform the way in which I love others and in that also will stir my heart up to love him more which then will work itself out with me loving my wife more. See, it's a perspective thing. 
If your seven steps to being a better husband leave, this was from last week, leave with you looking at you going, I got to do these seven things. A, you're not going to do any of them, which is why there's so many of these sermons out there because seven didn't work, so five must. And five was too short, so I bet nine's the number. They're all the same thing. It's just a repackaged self-help. But when you hear a sermon about being a better husband and you go, I can't do that. I have to look outside of me to Jesus Christ One, to forgive me for the screw up of a husband that I've been. And two, to to give me the example and and the motivation to go sacrificially love my wife at great cost to me. That that is an otherworldly sort of motivation if you're going to love like that. Because we know this. Taking a bullet for somebody is actually a lot easier than dying to yourself every day. So the practical gospel's not of great help either. And then finally, and I do hate this one, the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel is is the most peddled of all the false gospels. Also called the word of faith gospel. The prosperity gospel is essentially this. God exists for you to be happy. God exists for you to be healthy. God exists for you to prosper financially. The reason that God exists in the universe is basically to make much of you. Now, Kenneth Copeland won't say that. He just says it all the time. But he's not going to come out and say that the reason that God exists is to make you whatever. But listen to the message that they're preaching. If you have enough faith, You can unlock your breakthrough. That's another way they say it. The breakthrough could be in your health. The breakthrough could be in your finances. The breakthrough could be in your relationships. But but generally, basically the idea is, not not one of repentance, none of that. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about repentance. Just talk about the power of, of, of me thinking positively Talk about um, the fact that God's a father and fathers like to bless their kids. And if a father's going to bless their kids, it means he's going to give them stuff. Therefore, God exists to give you stuff. You know, you could talk a little bit of philosophy in there. Keep the Bible open. Talk about God sometimes. Talk about love sometimes. But essentially, the prosperity gospel is this. God is a cosmic slot machine. You put the right combination of faith plus some money, you put that into that machine. The money is never money, though. It's always a seed. Keep that in mind. It sells a little easier. It's a seed. So you, you have faith. You sow a seed. Here comes the blessing. I hate many things about that gospel. I hate this the most. Specifically in the realm of healing and the idea that God never wants us to be sick. And if we are sick, whose fault is it? Well, it can't be God's because he doesn't want us to be healed. Or, I'm, I'm sorry, it can't be God's because he, he wants us to be healthy. And, and, and they'll say this. Todd White says this. Benny Hinn says this. Kenneth Copeland says this. That it is always God's will for you to be healed. Well, if that's true, and I'm not being healed, then where's the problem here? Well, it's not with God, so it has to be with me. Now, when you, when you have a television ministry by which you never go into a hospital and pray with anyone, then you can get away with that kind of crap. But that does not work in hospital rooms. It works at big crusades where Benny gets up there and invites everybody to come down it, you know, and prays for those who have headaches, but never, never the, uh, I'm dying of cancer. It, it works in that setting, but it doesn't work in actual pastoral ministry that Paul's calling Timothy to. It doesn't work there. You're not going to go up to somebody and pray that God would heal them in the hospital because they're dying of cancer. And say, look, I prayed with you yesterday. Are you healed? No, I'm not. Have more faith. Do you know what you're doing to them? Now, not only are they dying of cancer, but now they're also carrying the burden of the fact that they're dying of cancer. 
rather than the fact that we live in a broken world and cancer exists in this world. And God's sovereign over all things, including your cancer. And he may heal you right now, and I'm going to lay my hands on you and pray that he does. But if he doesn't, healing's coming. Jack Frost died yesterday. I don't know if you guys know that. He was a pastor here. Found he had cancer. Two-year-old boy of his, little baby, Joshua, died, died yesterday. The Lord called him home. How long, how, many, how long, how many times had we prayed that God would heal him? Lots. You know what God said yesterday? I'm answering that prayer. Jack, it's time to come home. So we do not, I mean, and so like you think about the theology behind this garbage and you go, there isn't, I mean, it's terrible, there isn't any. And then you think about the practical implications of what they're saying and you would conclude, you would conclude, there's no way anybody listens to these fools. Except for it's not the case. Except for thousands and thousands and thousands of people have, have been misled by these kind of myths and these kind of ideologies and this kind of crap that is not good news. And church, we must not be them. We want to be people that, that, that sit under the Word, that endure a hard word from the Lord and, and endure. Now, I need to point this out, and then, and then we're, we're nearly, nearly done. Watch what Paul tells Timothy here in verse 5. I, I, I actually um, chuckled uh, as I continued reading this, because I'm just going to read all of it to you, and then we're going to make an observation and be out of here. <clears throat> so, Timothy, they're going to leave. Um, they won't endure healthy teaching. They're going to go find false teachers. They're going to turn away from listening to you, to the truth, to, to, to me, Paul, and they're going to wander off into myths. But as for you, so Paul's like, enough about them, Timothy. As for you, now watch this. Always be sober minded, always be clear headed, Timothy. Be balanced in your thinking, Timothy. Don't pinball around with emotions, Timothy. Don't overreact when somebody leaves, Timothy. D don't, um, don't get into excess of anything, Timothy. Excess money, excess alcohol, excess... Timothy, be sober-minded. Aim, aim at the reward. Aim at the goal. Keep your head there and, and go. Endure suffering. We hardly need to say much about that. Timothy, endure suffering. It's coming for you. All those who desire to live a righteous life will suffer. Timothy, suffering's coming. Endure it. Do the work of an evangelist. I love the word work. Timothy, work at pre preaching the gospel so that men and women would believe it. Work at that. And then fulfill your ministry. So, I want you to think about this. It's humorous to me the lengths to which the Apostle Paul goes to point out to Timothy that if you want glitz and glamour, you want a so-called following, you want an easy road to walk, pastoral ministry is probably not for you. Timothy, those, those guys out there, they're not sober-minded. Those guys out there, not only do, do they um, not suffer themselves, but they believe that God doesn't um, even allow suffering for his children. Timothy, those guys out there, they aren't doing the work of an evangelist. They don't care. They just want money. But Timothy, as for you, you, you don't do that. You, and, and then watch, watch how Paul concludes. For or because. So Timothy, to be clear, I'm not calling you to do something that I myself haven't done. In fact, let me just remind you of the model of ministry that you're following. For, because I, Paul, am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. He's not sitting in an airport waiting for his plane to fly in. Paul's in prison about to die. My, I'm about to leave. He says, 
I have fought the good fight and it was a fight. I have finished the race and it was a race. And I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Can I ask you a question? Why doesn't Timothy, after reading these words, pack it up? (laughs) Say, man, if that's what I'm called to, if that's where I'm headed... I'm out of here. What what keeps a preacher Christ-centered? What keeps a preacher God-exalting? What keeps a preacher like young Timothy here or Paul looking at the cost? People are going to malign you and leave and lie and go after myths and garbage and there's not going to be anything you can do about it. It's going to break your heart. What keeps a preacher from, from selling out? Well, here's Paul's answer. A greater reward. A greater reward. The way in which a people are shaped who rather than the quick gains of notoriety and the quick gains of having their ears scratched and the quick gains of a quote-unquote following, the quick gains of of always being affirmed and, and applauded, The the way that a people are shaped who would rather go for the greater reward than, than the quick gains are a people who have been shaped by the very word that Paul is calling Timothy to preach. Paul has been shaped by this word. And because Paul has been shaped by this word, because Paul encountered Christ, Paul says, I am going to die for this, and the die and to die will be gain. Because his affections have been so transformed away from the quick cotton candy kind of satisfaction that the world offers, he's looking to the reward, Christ. And he says, I would easily forsake that in order to take hold of him. And then he finishes, and not only to me. So, Timothy, this isn't just me but to all who have loved His appearing. I preach with a goal in mind of God through His Word creating and shaping a people who look to the great reward of His return and are motivated to live for Him because of that and who have the ability to say no to the false teaching, and to say no to the, to the quick self-help, and to say no to those other myths and that other garbage. I, I, I preach for a people to endure suffering because they're looking to the reward. And in looking to Him, say no to all lesser rewards. Father, would You shape us like that? Would you shape me like that? God, would you do that work in us? As we hear your word preached, Father, would you stay us? Would you keep us? Would you hold us? Would you shape us? God, would you allow us to endure And Father, might we be a people who have eyes for none but Christ, who lean forward in anticipation of His return. God, who 
forsake all lesser rewards in order to have Him. God, would You do that for Your glory? In Your name.